What's going on, everybody? This is your host, Jerome Moore of Deep Dish Conversations. And today we have a, I'm going to say a Nashville legend. Oh, God. <laughs> that's scary. I, I, I'm going to say a Nashville young legend. You that's, know, that's scary. Uh, we got Jamel Campbell Gooch. Man, I, I can say COB, Gideon's Army, mm-hmm. you know, this Nashville native, North Nashville native. It's, it's so many things, adjectives and things I can just incorporate into mm-hmm. just who you are, man. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm excited, man. I'm usually excited all the time when I do these, but I'm extra excited today. I'm extra turned today, man. How you doing? Man, I'm doing well. I'm doing well, man. I ain't got nothing to complain about, man. Nashville's in a very good, we're in a good spot. You know what I'm saying? I think we're in a place across this country where like black folks in particular are in unique positions to lead right. us up out of here and right. actually change the material conditions for our folks. So I'm excited. You know man, what I'm saying? Let's get right into it, man. What conditions are you talking about? <laughs> so, I mean, if we talk about where we from very specifically North Nashville, right. it, it's like if you take a snapshot in any part of history, there's usually like adversity happening in North Nashville. Um, I think the circumstances that we're feeling now all have to do with something that me and you grew up around was dead ends. Right. Right. My thoughts or just like my experience in North Nashville very specifically when I was growing up on Clay Street, is I realized like we had a shit ton of dead ends that didn't make no sense. Right. On the other end of that dead end is the interstate. Right. And so when the city decided to build that interstate right there, they displaced over 620 black homes, over 50 black businesses, over 25 rooming houses, and destroyed over 25 black churches. And so just for the listeners, what that interstate you're talking about stretches through, like go over Jefferson Street, all of those, all where the HBCUs are, all of that. So it's just, you know, peculiar that they put the interstate right through, you know, the thriving heart of the black culture in Nashville. Right, not even the heart of North, not even the heart of Nashville. I mean, not even the heart of black Nashville. It's really the soul of the entire city. Mm. Every everything that the city that Nashville is known for can be t- directly tied to right. North Nashville, whether it's mu- being known as the Music City, tied right. directly to the Jubilee Singers, right. singing around the world, the right. East City, the Progressive City, tied to like the student activism right. during the Civil Rights Movement, even right. Hot Chicken, tied directly to Princess Hot Chicken. Right. So we're not just talking about an area of North Nashville that is just like rooted in being black here. We're right. also talking about the thing that literal people that define the culture of the city. Right. And so like those material conditions that we talked about very much so earlier is all directly tied to poverty. Right. Right. The, the way we've treated North Nashville has created a condition where poverty is rampant and usually where you have poverty rampant, you have violence, you have all of these other social ills. But the beautiful thing about North Nashville is if we can fix it in North Nashville, we can fix it anywhere across Tennessee, just period. Man, it's it's crazy, man, that like like in North Nashville, like specifically you talk about a lot of these dead ends that you grew up around. Those who might not know. Yeah. <laughs> what are those dead ends that you're talking about? Yeah, so I mean, I'm thinking about excuse me if I'm wrong, I'm thinking about streets like Scoville, right, Underwood. Right. It's just like they're literally 23rd. streets. So the reason why none of the avenues co- connect in Nashville is right. because there's an interstate through the middle of right. them. So we, I mean, we talk about traffic all the time being an issue, right. but no one ever really brings up the fact that the reason that we have a traffic problem is because the people who are in power right. making the city plan, m- making the city planning and building the city infrastructure were racist right. and anti-black. Right. So they made a decision based on that, based on that social ill that they have. And right. what, what we're seeing at this point is we're seeing how a decision made in that type of evil and dogged and unrighteous ideology will lead to harming everyone in the city. Right. Everyone right. has to deal with that traffic shit. Right. Right. And the reason is, is because they decided to drive an interstate Right. directly through the heart of North Nashville. You know, it's crazy, man, growing up in North Nashville and in Nashville, man, I never realized how white Nashville was. Because, you know, you, and like, you know, we talking about the melting pot, but, like, we were very so much segregated, right? For sure. And so until I got older, right, and started like, damn, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a lot of white people. I don't see a lot of people look like me doing the work that we do or has sure. the resources to like, continue the work that we do, right? Yeah. And so it's always, it's, and it's also amazing when you think about Nashville and you talking about the soul of this North Nashville, the Jubilee Singers, Fist, the Freedom Riders, the Cityans, right, and all that, right? right? You talk about all these things, but like, when you ask a lot of people about Nashville, when you talk about blackness, a lot of people talk about Memphis. 
For right? sure. Right? They, for you sure. know, when you talk about Nashville, it's like more of country music. For sure. It's, you know, rightfully so, you know, yeah, rock yeah. and roll, the yeah. CMA Awards, all these things. Yeah. And so when you bring up all that, like, historical facts, man, it's crazy how it just kind of gets set to the side. For sure. And even those things like country music, like that, like, nobody ever really talks about D4 Bailey. You right, know what I'm saying? Right. Like, or when we talk about rock and roll, no one really talks about how, like, that was a staple for black musicians here. Right. Like, so anything that pretty much, Nat, what I've realized is, like, anything that pretty much Nashville is known for, once you start peeling back the layers over and over again, you're going to usually arrive at somebody black. Right. Or a black community trying to have self-determination for themselves. Right. Man, how was it for you growing up on Clay Street and in North Nashville? Just like, how was your adolescence, man? How was your childhood? So my childhood was pretty, I mean, I mean and that's a convoluted question. Right. Because my, the adults around me, the tribe, my, my family, my folks in North Nashville made sure, like, I had a very, like, stable foundation. Right. So a lot of the things that I realized were after the fact was when I started leaving North Nashville, when I, when I started broadening my horizon, things like I didn't know there was a such thing as a 24-hour grocery store right. until I left North Nashville. Right. Because on my streets, everything closed at 8. Right. Kroger's, everything, right. Walmart, Walgreens. Right. It was a ghost town after 8 o'clock. Right. So I remember when I, when I first got to TSU and I had a, met a brother that was from Franklin, Mm -hmm. I went out there to visit his parents' house. I remember, like, seeing, like, the grocery stores being 24 hours and, like, yo, right. is this normal <laughs> type shit? And so, like, small things like that, like, I didn't realize. Like, shit, like, we used to have, like, police officers literally just, like, speeding up and down Clay Street all right. times of night. I remember at one point in time, my next-door neighbors had a raid executed on their homes, mm. and I didn't know what was going on. Right. Like, I didn't know, like, what was happening, and I just know, like, so... Even going back in time, my growing up in North Nashville was like very much so like family oriented, right. supported, right. nothing bad. It was right. all stable foundation. Right. But we were able to navigate those social ills. The adults around me were able to navigate those social ills in a way where it would just seem like, all right, these are normal things. We're going to be resilient when it comes to them. Right. I remember realizing like, nah, this was specifically planned this way. Right. Right. Like, North Nashville is a dead end. If right. you look at it on the map, you can only get the Bordeaux one way. Right, across the highway. And you can only get out of it a couple of different ways. Right. But it's only three, it's only three ways out of North Nashville. Right. So right. when a city is building like that, right. putting black folks on an island, right. then it's like the issues that I saw growing up, whether it was poverty, economic deprivation, uh, low funded schools, schools right. that don't have enough books to right. go around, no overcrowded housing. classrooms, right. not enough housing, right. drugs, police everywhere. None of that stuff was normal. Right. But when I grew up, we just navigated it. Right, right. You, know you, just, you, you think it's normal, right? You get conditioned to it. For right? sure. I remember telling somebody for the first time, I was pulled over 28 times. So, so I, like early on, I started working at Foot Locker. That's where I got my first job. So I would have to take, I would have to go 65, get off at Metro Center and like go them back ways. You know, you can either go right. Bordeaux or you right. can go uh, down Clarksville Highway to get to Clay Street. Right. And like at the time, the, the chief, I think it was Chief Surpass, had an initiative called Nashville Safe Streets where they would flood areas with police officers with the idea of like deferring crime. Right. And so they would defer areas between, I mean, they would run into areas between 9.30 and Four, no, 3 a.m. Mm -hmm. Right in the pocket of when the mall closes. Right. So when I'm driving through, I'm hitting like every single block, police officer, police officer, police officer, <laughs> right. police officer. I was getting pulled over so many times that at one point, and I'm not getting tickets. Like, right. they just checking my ID. Right. 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 At some point, they was just like, oh, we know him. He getting off of work. Wow. And just kept letting me go. Wow. But it's just like the idea that I'm getting pulled over so right. much they having to run my license i'm having just from going to work right so things like that i thought were normal right until i became a man and realized like nah that was intentionally playing right. that way man it's funny because you you made me bring up think about a story that like i think i had to be like man second or third grade it might have been going like the cumberland or something like that mm -hmm. um cumberland damn yeah, that's yeah, why you're right <laughs> like, it, was, it was man i can't i can't remember cumberland, i can't wow. remember i can't i can't i can't remember what school but i know i was young yeah and growing up Man, we took a we took a field trip. 
Yep. You know, just black kids took a field trip to the police station, right? Yeah. Not, you know what I'm saying? Not knowing what's going on. We, you yep. know, because you're a kid, you don't, you can't really see like what's going on. You yeah, think police, sure. guns, mm -hmm. oh, you know, fun, you know. Yeah. And uh, man, don't you know? You know, they took our fingerprints and everything. Went through that, and like, and at the like, when what I think about fuck? it, right? Really? When I think about it, like, it's yeah. crazy. But like, yeah. like in hindsight, as you like, you said, you get you become a man, and you think about these things. Like, damn, like. They was already locking me in. I'm thinking I'm having fun. I'm thinking that I'm getting an experience, but like yeah. it's an alternative kind of initiative, alternative sure. thinking to what they doing, alternative planning to what they doing or trying to do or just making sure like they keeping track of everybody, man. So sure. it's, it's wild how those type of experiences, um, um, I just really affect how you think going forward, but you don't realize it while you're in the moment. No, nah, definitely, definitely. And even, and even when you talk about that, What's, what's, what's wild to me is how, like, first of all, systems center, the systems of how they are now, our systems mm -hmm. of accountability, center punishment. Right. They don't center the harm. Right. They center how much time you're going to get, how long you're going to be suspended from school, how much is your fine going to be. They're not centering, okay, relationships were harmed here. How can we repair that harm? It's fundamentally not set up to where right. actually you can get your harm repaired, right? right? Um, and so when you think about it, even from that, like we socialize our children through in school suspension, right. out of school suspension, expulsion to experience accountability in a way that is harmful to them. Right. right. So if you got a student that's been experiencing like in school suspension or out of school suspension for years. Right. Right. When they get out, it's going to be like this is normal. I'm used to this. Right. right? Even if you talk about like what we experience on a daily, like you can thoroughly equate that to account accountability in school and discipline, like, right? And so when I'm trying to break down the school to prison pipeline for somebody, I literally ask them these questions, right? When you're driving, what do you get? Nervous. Okay, right. Somebody pulls you over, what do you get then? More nervous. Okay, and then, <laughs> so do they give you, do they give you like a ticket? If you keep if you keep getting pulled over for speeding, they're gonna give you a ticket, ticket right? right? Yeah. And so if you keep getting tickets, what's gonna happen? I mean, you're gonna get your license suspended. Right. And if you get caught driving without a license, what's gonna happen? Ah, you're gonna get put in jail. Exactly, right? And when and if you keep going to jail, what happens next? You stay in jail. Right. And then you go to prison, and then right. when you come out of prison, what it what's what you want? Man, you can't get housing. Exactly. You can't get you not driving. Right. You lack of employment opportunities. Right, right, because you want probation <coughs> or parole. Right. Right. So that system exists in our schools. Right. You keep showing up to class late. You get a you get a, you get a referral. Right. Or a demerit, depending on where you are. <laughs> right. And you, you're taking us back. <laughs> right. You keep getting referrals. Right. You get put in ISS, which really looks very similar to solitary confinement. Right. You keep going to in school suspension. You go out of school suspension. Right. You come back from out of school suspension. You're behind. And they my students will say I'm on papers. Right. Which is ironically very similar to what somebody will say if they on parole. Exactly. So what we did is we've trained our students to experience these punitive forms of accountability and not get any of their needs taken care of. Like you said before, they're behind. Just like once you come out of prison, you're yeah. behind. Right. Because you were frozen in time, in time when you went in. Right. You know what I'm saying? But what I'm really hoping, and I think where we at in Nashville, and this is where my hopes come from, it feels like people are more understanding that that system of punitive punishment when it comes to accountability is not the way you actually change people. Right. The way you change people is giving them an opportunity to restore by centering the harm. Right. Yeah. What's up, family? It's Jamel Kamagucha. Check out Deep Jeff Conversations with Jerome Moore. Also, this shit fire. Make sure you go out to Geno's East. Man, how you liking the pizza, man? Man, I love it, yo. I love it. I'm still excited about it. That shit fire. <laughs> it's the only thing when you eat these pieces, man. The dough is so good, it's like it's hard to try to have a conversation. No, for sure. <laughs> and I'm not trying to drop these pieces like what you just said. Oh man, I, I dropped the whole. I was cutting it. See, I'm not trying to do that. I was trying to show off on the camera, and then mud just bloop. Up. I was like, damn. But man, <clears throat> um, I'm curious, man. I, I and and I know. There might be a lot of people, you know, that, that definitely know what you do, seen you. But uh, like in my case, man, like I, I like I don't have any immediate family that they was like directly involved in social justice work, mm -hmm. activism, mm -hmm. 
And so people always ask me a lot of times, like, how did you get involved? Like, what made you get, get yeah. involved into it? And sometimes it's hard to answer. It's like, just a, it just happened because I didn't mm -hmm. have no inspiration. Like, mm -hmm. be honest with you, it wasn't no inspiration. Like, I want to, like, kind of help my community. Mm -hmm. Outside of just having, like, a, I guess, internal social responsibility to do something for black folks. Yeah, for sure. Just knowing our historical past um, and what we've been through and what we're still uh, currently going through. So I'm, I'm going to pose that same question to you, man. What, how did you get into just activism and yeah. you know just social justice work in yeah. general, man? What is like? What was that? Where did that inspiration come from? So, so I answer it two different ways. So I'm definitely of the belief that like our pure existence as Black folks in a country that hates us is political, right? Right. And so like I thoroughly understand that and accepted that like very early on. What um, age? What, you, what age would you say? So my mom is like the first Black <clears throat> Black General Sessions secretary okay so i was able to see okay. like behind the curtain okay shout out to mama right for sure <laughs> pioneering and like right. and like i even tell her so she got that job in 88 i was born in 89 i even tell her like all that frustration that she felt all, all right. that hostility towards the people around her all that lack of control right was just like pushed out right. into me and so like <laughs> being somebody who grew up down there right you know i used to like it used to be judges that would like babysit me right while, while like behind closed doors in the courtroom so being somebody who's seen that right. and saw how just like the system just don't hold black lives is precious right you know really gave me an upbringing where i'm like oh yeah like we got to figure this out it's also something very interesting that I, that i read not too long ago i think it's by uh cedric j robinson that put it like this the book might have even been called like the making of the black radical tradition and he posed it like is black folks ex proximity to whiteness okay. that activates them because it's some of our folks that don't ever see how much is being stolen mm -hmm. right who don't ever get to see around that by, behind that curtain they only working to survive but it's the ones who actually see and get close that are like oh yeah y'all got everything here that we would need to solve a problem there right but y'all don't want to give it to us right so we need to organize to take it and that's where i am with it you know what i'm saying right. and through all of that calling i mean also like i said i got pulled over 28 times all of all of the, the majority of the men in my family was swept up in a rico case at one point in time right. so like all the legal troubles uh that my folks had also you know i had classmates that were gunned down right you know uh i grew up in 3728 which is known to have the highest levels of incarceration um if you drill down even further than that they have the highest levels of incarceration for people born in the 80s right so these are my friends my neighbors the people right. i went to kindergarten people with, our age you see what i'm saying yeah. who were more so in the zip code that we were in we were more likely to go to prison right. than anywhere else and right. if you mix that even with today we were talking about this earlier, how like Nashville Bay specifically in Davidson County, the livable wage makes 50, it's 51,000. So you need to be able to make, you have to have a salary of 51. Minimum. In order to survive here. Right. Right. But the average person in North Nashville individual makes 19K and the average two parent households make 21K. So in that gap is all the social ills that we see every single day. Right. But what if I was to tell you there's programs out here that fix that gap, right? right. Where, we, where we talk about universal basic income, guaranteed basic income, direct cash transfers. Even when we talk about accountability, we talk about violence and eruption. Right. So there's programs out there that'll fix these things. Right. But it almost feels like the knowledge about these things are being intentionally held back so we can't solve the problem. Right, man, and you bring up an interesting thing I'm 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 personally a person that believes in community for sure. first over politics, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I think in my in my in my very humble opinion that, you know, we're operating in a system that we can't we can't as black folks, we can't expect or hope or have faith that it's gonna fix the issues that it's socially engineered for black folks. For sure. Right? And so when you talk about some of those programs and you know, I kinda wanna pivot into what Gideon Army does specifically yeah, especially yeah, with sure. you know with the violence interrupters uh -huh. you all are doing it yourself you saying right. we're not waiting on nobody no to to, to combat our oppressions we yeah. can't depend on no system we can't depend on no this elected official we can't depend on individuals to fix problems that we know that's here we can't wait for bureaucracy to catch up and say oh you're right like right. we caused this we're gonna fix it now right right um hot like so 
what would you say to the black folks out there, to the black people out there that maybe just believe, you know, you know, every four years, you know, I cast my vote. That's well, it's sure. more comfortable for me to do. Um, sure. There's some accountability on that yeah. part, but I'm on the. I'm more on the seat of mm, that can't be it. You gotta, you, you, we, we gotta do more. We have to do more. We, yeah, we can't sure. just believe in and put all of our energy every four years into that. No, I agree. I agree. And so what I would say back is just like, what are you voting for? Like that would be my question. And if and if that question is stumping mm. you, it's because there's no, we haven't built an agenda, right? So right. the thing that we're missing in Nashville for black folks is a shared community vision. Right. It's like, if we get a shared community vision, we've already done the mapping. It really only takes, okay, I'm going to get real heady. Let's, get, it let's go. Okay. Let's go. Let's, so, let's get it. So first Take of all, everybody. just Take like, very, so like very basic civic engagement shit, right? Nashville's local government is what we call a mayor dominant system. Right. Right. So if you had a flow chart in front of you, it would say mayor. Right. Of course, it would say voters at the top, but we know right. that that's some other shit. <laughs> right. But it would say mayor at the top and then every single branch, anything that is any has anything to do with our tax dollars right. is going to come directly from the mayor. Mayor can make a decision and it, is, right. it can change anything right. here. Right. Um, so we have a mayor dominant system. We also have the second largest city council in the country. Wow. That's second to Chicago. Right. So we have a lot of city council members. Right. So it takes half plus one to get anything moved city council. So look at it like it's very basically, and this is like a broad stroke, so I'm gonna lose a lot of context in this. Mayor makes a decision, council controls the purse. Okay. Right? Right. So if you don't have an agenda, or if you don't have a shared community vision, right. then it's very difficult to move anything through that structure. Right. right. You have a lot of different targets. You have a lot of different people that you need to move at one time. So when we talk about community and politics, like, we're going to have to start working to merge them. Mm -hmm. Right? Because like I said before, our existence as a community is political right. already. Right. And if we want something new to actually disrupt the harm, the thing that we can agree on is all of these systems were built to maintain and control black bodies. Right. We can agree on that. Right. And so in order to change that, we're gonna have to build out something new and, and then hold them accountable to making sure our demands are met. That's right. why uh, one thing that I'm really excited for next year is we've been holding these black autonomous spaces called the Black Nashville Assembly. Right. That can, that's a call out to anyone who's identi who identifies on the spectrum of blackness. So all the way from African American, Afro Latinx, Afro Caribbean, and like making sure that we can do three things: build a collective analysis. Okay. What's our issues? Right. As Black folks in Nashville. Right. What is oppressing us? Right. Build a build collective solutions. Okay. What do we want to do to solve these issues? Right. right. So if you identify poverty as one of those issues, right. we can talk about guaranteed basic income and right. how that's used globally. Right. Right. And then three, what's the collective action? Right. All right. So once we build those three things out, then it's actually like, it becomes a thing of, now we can actually build out a political agenda and we right. can start voting our actual services. We can start voting our actual needs right. and not just who appears to be more popular and who we think. A personality contest. Right, we, we, we change it from that because we got very rigid ideas right. that we need to move. And if we can get even heady into it, I mean, for each city council member, you really only need 300 folks in their district in order to flip the seat. Mm. And if we talk about movements in general, we know that it was only 2% of black churches that participated in anything Martin Luther King had going on. It's always a minority. Right. And so you really only need 200 dedicated folks and in, in black folks in Nashville to change anything. Right. Because it's going to be people that you're going to have early adopters and you're going to have late adopters. Right. You get 200 early adopters, you can pretty much change the world. That's deep. Yeah. <laughs> I know I went, I went, no, no, no. Cause you, you got, you got, you got me thinking and it's crazy. Cause you know, I know, you know, we talk about this stuff you just, you know, off camera and journal all the time. And, and to me, it seems like what you're saying, like we, we need to also practice community economics. For sure. You know, because you look at the landscape, if we, you know, we, we have these blackout things that we do as a, uh -huh. as a, as a, as a group, as a culture, you know, we only go buy black. But a lot of times, you know, I know here in Nashville, I don't think we don't have one black owned grocery store. Nope. You know, we have one black gas station, sweats, yep. right? Yep. Um, 
We have one black bank, Citizens. Yep. Um, so we talk about essential businesses. I think we have some black pharmacies. Yep. Um, but we talk about essential businesses, you know, that's what we need. We got a lot of barbershops. We got a lot of salons, right? Mm-hmm. But, you know, but we, we, if we, we can't own our own food, you know, they control it. That's, a, that's another political move, political siege, right? right? When it comes right. to those things. And we talk about these food deserts and stuff right. that go on. Right, right. And when we talk, and when we talk about business, very, black business very specifically, we know that we got folks out here that are making money right 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 and so like another thing about building out the black agenda is we'll be able to hold them accountable as well that it's just like yo like because at the end of the day business here well i i was told by a mentor of mine i ain't gonna say his name but he was like yo continuing the black radical tradition is rooted in being anti-capitalist Right, because right. we know that capitalism is a right. thing that's driving profits. Right. That's why you end up having for-profit prisons. Right. That's how you end up having highest incarceration rate in three seven two or eight because right. of fines and fees and people right. not being able to pay for them. Right. So that's when you have things like that. Early this year, I saw this test. I saw this narrative tested in the public realm. You might not have saw it because as soon as it happened, like people reacted in a beautiful way. Okay. But there was articles where MMPD, Metro Nashville Police Department, were claiming that because they couldn't pull over people as much, <laughs> that it was actually bankrupting the budget. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay, y'all just admit it that y'all was pulling people over to make money. Right, right. And like of everybody, course. everybody caught that. And right. so like you didn't see that a lot. Right. But it's like things like that when we talk about even black businesses. Right. Like it's like, okay, where your where your dollars going? Right. Who your exactly. dollars supporting? And, and so and, and my thing, my whole model and how I see it and when it comes to black businesses is the same thing that you're saying. It's like if we have our own black businesses, yep. those black businesses will be held accountable yep. to funding programs yep. in communities that yep. combat things that oppress black folks. Yeah, for sure. And that's housing, if yeah. that's education, is that, you know, um, um, community police, policing. Yeah. All of those things should be funded by those black businesses. For sure, and when we talk about very specifically what Gideon's Army does, whether it's violence interruption, in other words, street-based mediations. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've been trying to go into like rapid rehousing for young people that are, that are struggling with poverty. Um, we just started really, really diving into our street canvassing piece where we have street canvassers and street mediators literally looking for conflict to de-escalate. Those are human rights. Right. We just happen to be doing them because like you said, we can't wait for the bureaucracy to happen. Right. But we know that it's gonna come to a point where when we start teaching folks, even from people that are outside of our community, having people arrested Right. Is not going to change your material environment. Right. Having violence interruption where you actually have a group of credible messengers that the community knows that are being called in to de-escalate conflicts right. is actually going to make you safer. Right. Once that knowledge becomes widely accepted, then we're going to start seeing systems change. Right. Because people are going to be able to demand it. Right. Because you already pay for it through your tax dollars. I already pay so for we're it. already when we're talking about using even when we're talking about using black business to fund programs, I think we're gonna have to struggle with the fact that we're using them to fund programs so that we can show people from outside of our community how to actually solve problems that they've been hired by us to already solve. And so speaking of people outside of the community, mm-hmm. you know, you can be allies. Right. What are the what are what what do you see their role being that's best suited to for black folks moving forward yeah so uh, now nah, <laughs> nah, for sure like for sure so that's a difficult question i was having this conversation with the homie the other day and the homie was just like you know what like he was like you know he was like no nah, i rocks with some of y'all he was like he was like no nah, i rocks with some of the white folks especially the ones that said thanksgiving disowning their racist grandfather, right. causing all kind of hell at the family dinner because right. they because they done caught some shit and they calling everybody out on it. It was like right. I, I rocks with that. And so I have two roles like you either gonna build or destroy. Right. And sometimes you gotta destroy to build. Right. Right. And so I think some of the conversations that we need to have is we need to really talk about how we have harmed people at an epigenetic level. It's multi-generational. Right. And it's going to take twice as long to get out of it right. than it did to get into it. Right. Um, 
And so, so for it's gonna be a process, right? For allies, for co-conspirators, I know that there's going to be a need to jump into it head first, right? And take up way too much room, right? And so those folks need to do self work, mm-hmm. right? Whiteness, white supremacy, has corrupted everything, right? And until everyone is willing to accept that it has corrupted everyone and it is constantly socializing everyone to behave in a way that right. is actually counter conducive to right. black folks, then we ain't going to ever move forward. Is that you think that's a realistic conceptualization for, for white folks or for people to say, yeah, it's corrupting everything, so we need to fix it. Do you see that actually? Is that something realistic or just something like? You know, we would like to happen, but do you? But do you really feel in this country? Yeah. <laughs> so I think the first step. I think the first step. So yeah, I think it's realistic. Okay. I think we got. I think we got to come from a place of a visionary, visionary place. Right. And so I think very specifically in this country, we got to get a collective analysis. I think that's step one. Now that step one might take a very long time. Right. Because you got some people, who have. If I run it down, if we talking about police accountability. Of police brutality in Nashville, you got some people that are moved by, yo, we figured out with the driving while black report that between 2011 and 2015, MNPD was pulling over twice as many black people in Davidson County than there were black people in Davidson County <laughs> over the age of 16. Now, when I run it down like that, that's right. gonna move some folks. Right. They have a relationship to it with data. Right. But when I tell you, like, yeah, I've been pulled over 28 times leaving work. Right. That's gonna move somebody else. It sounds like, it sound like that's a reach, narrative. depending yeah, depending on who you who you telling that right. to. Right. So so we just gonna have to agree on what we all are experiencing. Right. Right. And then once we're able to do that, we're gonna have to be willing to let some of our people catch up. Right. Because we ain't gonna be able to wrap our arms around everybody. Right. Because in wrapping your arms around everybody, you're gonna crack that foundation. Right. Right. And so I think that is doable. Do I think people are willing to work as hard as? do the hard work to get there, not all the time. Because I think where, where we're at right now, it's really about immediate gratification. Right. What can I do right now? Right. Who can I solve right now? Right. What problem can I do right now? Right. Those solutions are in reach. But if right. we're talking about repaying historical, multi-generational harm, that is gonna start off as a crawl. Right. First. Right. Yeah. Man. I hope y'all taking these notes as listening to this. Cause this is deep. You know, like, it, and there's so many different ways to 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 go. But you know, these are deep dish conversations for real. No, for sure. And, and I want the listeners, you know, and the people watching this to really take heed and take note of what Jamel is saying because it is really heady. But if you take your time and slow it down, you can yeah. catch everything. And yeah. no matter what city you in, right? No, this, for this sure. is not just Nashville. But for those people that are in Nashville, uh, Jamil, yeah, how can they get involved? How can they how can they be an ally? How can they get involved? How can they show support um, to to Gideon's Army or any kind of yeah. just social justice movement that's going on to to make this city specifically equitable for everybody? So I will start off like saying like this is a movement, not a moment, and everyone's participation is required right now, right? Right. And so, like, what I would say first is we got to start off with the basics, right? Talk to your folks. Right. What's moving you? Right. What's your politics? Right. What makes you vote? What makes you write a check? What just, like, is moving your soul? Figure out where you connect and then work on that thing together. Build some synergy around that. And as you do that, you will find more people. We got to start talking about our politics. There's, being apolitical is a myth. Right. So if you're apolitical, you're still falling into something. We're, right. not, we're not playing those games. Right, right. So I would say, like, literally start off with, hey, what do you believe in? Right. Because if you don't know that, if you've never asked that question to your homies, right. you might actually have something that's, like, really destructive. And right. you might be participating with something unknowingly that's actually destroying folks. Right. And then I would say, too, collective vision. All right, you rock with this, what's the solution? Right. Because we're going to have to work on it. We right. got tidal waves of issues coming to Nashville. And then thirdly, what I would say is like define your politics and then play your role. Hmm. Because I think 
what we want to do is we want to hop into things and get 10 feet deep into them. Right. When we need to walk into them slowly. Right. Put uh, your toe into it. For sure. Yeah. For sure. Very specifically with Gideon's Army, we are a nonprofit. Like I said before, all of the, the services that we provide are human rights. Right. But we don't receive any funding from the local city. Right. So we're always having to like fundraise. We're always having to get more money in the bank. We can never have enough. And by us being a black organization, unapologetically black, we don't get the same amount of investment right. as other organizations do. Oh, really? You don't? Right. <laughs> right. But we have 30 <laughs> that's times. In, that's but interesting. We, but we have 30 times the impact, though. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, like, definitely donate. But also, like, if we're going to be in this for a long-term thing, people are going to have to do that self-work. Right. It's just going right. to have to start there. Right. It's going to have to start with I. You can't identify your brother unless you know yourself because your brother is actually projection of you outside of you. So right. if you don't know who you are, you ain't going to never find your community. Because right. that's where it's going to start and where it's going to end. Hey, I couldn't have said it better myself. Man, where can, where can people reach you at, Jamil? If they want to find out more information, how to get involved, they want to, yeah. you know, I, I would encourage any and everybody to donate, you know. No, um, for sure. To, you need, you know, organize people and organize money. No, for right? sure. That's, that's, that's what we need to, to, to keep this thing, keep this movement moving. Because it's just not a moment, like Jamel said. But where can people contact you directly? Yeah, man. So, like, um, I'm Nashville Red on everything, no spaces. Um, you can also email me at jgooch at onearmyunited.org. Those are all words. Like I said, you can visit gideonsarmyunited.org. You can also visit rebuildnorthnashville.com. Um, we got a lot of programs coming. We got a lot of things that we're trying mm -hmm. to work on. And we're really trying to push innovation in the city when it comes to solving problems. Our main goal is to disrupt the school to prison pipeline. What we're trying to do right now is we're trying to disrupt all systems of harm right. from the top to the bottom, right? And in order to do that, we're going to need as much support as possible. But you can always hit me up in my DMs, Nashville Red, on every single thing. Hit them up in the DMs. For sure. Jamel, man, I appreciate it, man. Hey, we're going to continue eating this no, pizza. Fire. But, you know, we'll holler at y'all later. Uh, thank everybody for watching. Make sure you subscribe. Follow us on Instagram and all that. And make sure you share this video for all your friends, no matter what city you're in, but especially Nashville. All right. Peace. Peace, y'all. Hey.